So this is things, even if you're not ready to invest, these are things you should be looking at with investment properties. And there's great opportunities for investments in every market, including yours. You can start off with single family homes. You can start off with duplexes or quadplexes. You can get into apartment complexes. We have 12 or more doors. Um, a lot of my investments are in commercial real estate. So I'll invest in office buildings. I'll buy big, like I started, really got some new traction during COVID, but I bought bigger office buildings. Instead of renting the one tenant, I'll rent on each door in there. Kind of like a commercial apartment complex. So let's start with, let's say, an average single family home if you wanted to rent it out. So let's say you bought a home for 300,000, all right? Now, first thing you wanna do is look at how much you think you can get for rent per month off of that $300,000 home. So in my neck of the woods, Baldwin County, you could probably get somewhere in the upwards of 1,800 plus a month for that home. $1,800 for you bringing in and renting on that property. So single family home, next thing you want to do is take out any expenses. All right, so chances are you're going to have insurance, you're going to have termite, right? um, general maintenance. So with a single family home, if you're managing it yourself, I'd probably put the expenses somewhere around 15%. All right. If you've got somebody else managing it, you're probably going to be somewhere around 25%. So quick math, I'll take that, and I always do, I got single family, I don't want to do it by myself. So I'll take that 21, 6. I'll times that by 0.85. And that gives me 18,360 left over, right? So that's my hmm. NOI. NOI is your net operating income. So that's before debt service. So that doesn't include what your mortgage payments are going to be. But some quick math, if you take that 18,360 and divide it into 300,000, you're going to get a zero, uh, 0 0.06, which is actually, you'll move that decimal point over two points, and that'll be a 6.1% cap rate. So what's the use of looking at this cap rate? What this cap rate tells you is if you can get a loan on that property for 6.1% or less, you can be cash flowing on. So that's a quick way to kind of do that math. And you want to constantly do that. So in this market, I probably wouldn't buy anything right now that's under a 9% cap rate. So I would constantly be doing this math on different properties, about 10, 15, 20 different properties a week, trying to figure out the best deals out there. But that's a quick way to just kind of get a quick snapshot. Now, if you can get that price down and raise that cap rate up, you're in a good spot. So I'll kind of pause right there to see what kind of questions you guys got for me. So what you, I thought you said cap rate was if you get below that and in your interest on the mortgage, is that what you were saying? Yeah, so let's say your interest rate's at 8.2, mm -hmm. you're gonna be making cash flow. But if your interest rate's a uh, five, eight year old, 5.5 or 5.8, you know, you're gonna be positive cash flow. Okay. So for a rule of thumb, what you're looking at is <clears throat> if your interest rate exceeds your cap rate, walk away. Walk away from it. Yeah. Okay. Try to work that deal down. Now, right now, the great thing about right now is in the next six to probably 18 months, there's going to be some deals hitting the market. There's going to be people that have to sell, regardless of interest rates or anything else. And it's an opportunity to buy up. Anytime that the market kind of contracts, it's a great opportunity to buy property. So my suggestion to anybody I talk to is save money. Save money right now, because there's going to be some deals that you wish you would have been in a position to buy coming up very soon. What other kind of questions you guys got for me? So that's the, that's, that's the, the biggest thing, and you can break this down in different ways too. You gotta, hey Tim, are you considering this with like no, no cash down kind of mortgage situation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when you okay. calculate that cap rate, when you take that 18 into that 300,000, that calculation is, that cap rate is that calculation without a mortgage, basically. Yep. It kind of gives you the cost before debt service. 
So I'll give you another example. And I'll give you one of my examples. My example is um, a condo I bought in Orange Beach. So I bought the condo, similar situation that, um, three years ago was during a kind of a commercial downturn. I would say, well, maybe not, but I got it for a good price. I got it for two twenty-five dollars in Orange Beach, right by the beach. You can't beat that. All right. This property cash flow is an average of four seventy-five dollars per office times six offices. So what do you want for that? Twenty-eight fifty. And then everything in the real estate world will be done by twelve. So this time's up by twelve. Thirty-four two. Thirty-four two hundred. All right. My expenses on that property are probably about fifteen percent. So we'll say thirty-four two hundred times point eight five. Twenty-nine thousand seventy. Twenty-nine thousand seven hundred. Seven hundred or seven. About seventy dollars. Seven seventy. All right, so what was this number called? Do you remember? The net operating income. Yeah. And the net operating income. Perfect. And then we're going to take that number and divide it into 225,000. What was that number again? Oh, So this property was 12.9 capital when I bought it. So I bought it at that price and got it financed for 4.25. 4.25%. You have your real estate and compounding, this is how you snowball it. This is how I went to one to 10 properties. Was snowballed that. And so just last year, I refinanced this property. So I want to keep in mind, I put down 20%. What's 20% of 225? So I put down 45,000. All right. Last year, no, not last year, probably about six months ago, I refinanced this property for 270. I pulled out close to $50,000 I used for another property. Got all my initial cash back. Refinancing the property is what's called a non-taxable event. So they don't tax me for one penny. If I sold the property, it taxed me 40% of that. Refinancing didn't tax a penny, non-taxable event. Put that back into it, still at somewhere around the 8% cap. I refinanced at 5.25%. So the beauty of the real estate is, it's taking that money and continuing to invest it back into it or pulling out that refi. And it's a little bit of play in the tax game. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of people only look at, okay, what am I paying right now? But what are you not paying for the IRS as well? You can take a lot of your interest rate, your expenses, all those things, and write them off as well. Or it should be good as a personal property. Mm -hmm. um, next thing I'll take a second to talk about is a hack. So how many of you guys have, you guys, any of you guys have any investment properties right now? Okay. So a hack to get your first investment property, how many people here own a house? Right? So you own your house. So a good a hack that a lot of people are doing is they'll take their house and if they feel like it could be a good rental property, they'll retain their home as a rental property and buy a new property. That's the fastest, quickest, easiest way. The beauty of it is, is you're only putting down three or four, five percent on that first house because it's not an investment property. You buy an investment property, you put down 20 percent. But if you use your own home and retain it as an investment property, you buy that next home, you find that maybe there's a big deal going on with a new construction building that's doing buy down costs, interest rates are a couple points lower, um, depending on how much you owe in your house. And look at all that cash flow you can bring in just from renting your house out. So just look at your mortgage payment. Let's say your mortgage payment's fifteen hundred a month, you know, and you can maybe bring in 
18, $2,000 a month, it may not be a ton of cash flow, but is it enough to start paying one or two of your bills and then build that up after a year of that home? A lot of times I've seen somebody do it in my market. Five years in a row, they did this hack five times and now they're up to six investment properties. So it's just a slow way to continually start to start to build that trend. And in my mind, it doesn't matter if interest rates are 4% or 10%, if the property's cash flow and it makes sense. And when it's cash flow, high, I mean, when the interest rates are higher, it's just more of a write off. So you really got to look at that gap, and it's not as bad as people think because it's helping you on your, your tax returns.